So welcome everybody um, to the session, The Agrarian Renaissance and The Great Rethink, um, a book launch with our Oxford Real Farming Conference's co-founder, Colin Tudge. My name's Ruby Reed. I'm the co-founder of Advaya, a platform running courses, events and gatherings for transformative education that explore the connection between ecology, well-being and spirituality. I'm honoured to be speaking with Colin about his new book, The Great Rethink, a 21st Century Renaissance, which has excitingly just been awarded the 2020 Science and Medical Network Book Prize. No doubt many in the audience will already know about Colin's prolific life and work, but for those who haven't yet had the pleasure, Colin's given talks and written many articles and books on topics from natural history, evolution and food and farming to the philosophy of science and metaphysics. In 2008, he established the Campaign for Real Farming. In 2010, co-founded the Oxford Real Farming Conference and is now helping to set up the College for Real Farming and Food Culture, which is intended to provide the intellectual underpinning for an agrarian renaissance. In Colin's new book, he asks how we can create convivial societies in a flourishing biosphere based on fundamental principles of morality and ecology. I might share, the sc I might share a screen so you can have a look at a flyer for that. Um, there we go. Um, and um, the key thesis is that we need a complete restart from first principles brought about by the people at large and guided by a metaphysics that has food and farming at the center. But Colin, you speak so much and have so much hope for the future, but is it actually possible to transform the whole system? Do you think the world isn't now beyond recovery? I don't think it's beyond recovery, otherwise I don't suppose I'd bother to write the book. I suppose I'd just go off somewhere and lie down. But <laughs> we must distinguish between hope and uh, optimism, I think. You never lose hope. As St Paul said this, hope is one of the great Christian virtues. But optimism is something else. Hope is the, what is it, what is it Emily Dickinson? Hope, hope, hope is the thing with feathers that, sit, that perches in the soul, that sings the tune, etc., etc. It's it's the thing, emotional thing that you must hang on to. Optimism is a real belief that we can do what we want to do, do what we need to do. I don't know whether we can. All I can say is that we can give it a very good shot. And if we did the right things, we really could turn the world around. It seems to me, I mean, it seems to everybody really, but it seems to me that the, well, there's a whole list, there's a whole list of things that we know are absolutely wrong with the world. But if I was looking at, let's what, say, what's the top four, I would say possibly, well, in no particular order, there's the question of human population, there's the question of food, which, of course, is what agriculture should be about, there's the problem, of course, of climate change, and there's that big, big question of mass extinction. And the, the reason why I feel less optimistic than, than should be possible is that we approach and the powers that be approach all these problems in my opinion with, with with wrongly and with the wrong underlying mindset take for example the issue of population which is key at the moment we've got sort of eight thousand eight million sorry eight billion people on board and it's going up fast now there was a time even 40 50 years ago when it was assumed in line with the thinking of Malthus at the beginning of the 19th century, that the, that the population would keep on rising at a tremendous speed, exponential speed, until it finally crashed because it just too many and then it would collapse. That was the mindset 50 years ago. That's what people believed. Now it's clear that the population, all populations of all animals are somewhat self-limiting. So actually, although the rate, the arithmetical rate of increase is still going up very fast, the actual percentage rate of increase is going down to the point where, according to the United Nations demographers, who let's say are the, probably the best informed in the world, the world population should stabilize at about 10 or 11 billion by the end of the century. Now, the question then becomes, can we actually sustain 10 or 11 billion people? And the answer is yes, but only with difficulty, really. It's, it's, quite, it's quite a big ask. Actually, we ought to be able to do it fairly easily, but no, only, only by making very big changes. But we ought to be able to do it 
even with present day technologies and so on, sustain 10 or 11 billion people, but it's not going to be comfortable. I had the opportunity a few years ago to ask some of the world's best thinkers on this matter, what do you think is the ideal population for us to have, the human species? And most of the people I spoke to said, well, about 2 billion, about a fifth of what we're likely to reach. And 2 billion was the, the population, the world population, uh, at roughly at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, as David Attenborough says, he's now in a, his 90s, the world population has increased about four times in his lifetime. And obviously you can't go on like that. But the, the question is, what do we do when we get to 10 or 11 billion? Do we sustain 10 or 11 billion for as long as we possibly can? Well, I think that's touch and go, really. Or do we actually try to bring it down to roughly, let us say, 2 billion? Incidentally, one of the people I asked, what, what do you think the ideal population should be, was a guy called Michael Soule, who at that point was the uh, president of the World Conservation Society. And he said, I think the ideal population would be about 300 million. In other words, about a 30th of what it could get to. And I thought this was incredibly small, draconianly small, but just as a sort of exercise, a mental exercise, he pointed out that 300 million was probably the world population at about the time of Christ. And he said, if you look at what was going on at the time of Christ, intellectually and spiritually, all the, the various religions flourishing and Greek science and so on, uh, it was tremendously varied culturally, and it could do everything with 300 million that you can do with, uh, at that time, 6 billion. You see what I mean? I mean, we needn't be frightened about the population getting small. Now, the question then is, if you got it down to 2 billion or even 1 billion, what would be the advantage? Well, the advantage, if you've got the world population down to about 1 billion, is that we could easily be able to accommodate everybody at a, at a high level without making any great strain on the biosphere at large if we played our cards right. So it, it, it's not a bad target. But the question is, how do you actually start reducing the world population? Now, my argument, which is the same as a lot of other people believe and a lot of good demographers believe, is that you get reduce the population from, let's say, the 10 billion at the end of the century down steadily over centuries to maybe 2 billion, maybe even fewer, but by non-draconian means. And the good thing, the, the, the serendipity, there's lots of serendipities along the way, the good thing is that all the measures to reduce birth rate and therefore to reduce population, all the measures that actually work are benign. And it's clear to see on sociological grounds, and just by asking people actually, that when people, well, when women in particular, have something to do outside the home, when they've got status in society, apart from the status that they get from being mothers, then actually most women choose to have fewer children. And in Western Europe over the last 60, 70 years, I think most countries, most Ital Italy, um, Britain, certainly Germany, have not been producing enough children of their own in order to maintain the pop population as it was. Populations going down in those countries. And the general lesson is that if only women were liberated and had opportunities outside the house, they would choose to have fewer children. Now, the other thing you've got to do if you really want to have fewer children is to be certain that the children are going to live. A lot of people have five or six or seven children because they're pretty convinced that most of them are going to die. So the second thing you really need to do is get infant mortality down, which is a good thing in its own right, obviously. And the third big thing is security in old age, because a lot of people, again, have lots and lots of children because they know when they're over 60, in, in most cases, they're going to be in trouble unless they have children to look after them. But if you've got a pension and some kind of economic security, then that ceases to be such an anxious thing. And in fact, as I say, when people are really doing well, as in Western Europe in recent decades, they choose to have two children or fewer, which actually brings the population down. Now then, so that you can bring the population down by benign means. And in fact, only by benign means can you do it, only by doing things that people really would like to happen anyway. And I see that as a, as, as a, as, as a hope. And 
the thing is, many people, still sort of quasi-religious people, I suppose, say, um, well, you know, if you have a smaller population, you've got fewer human souls. Isn't that a terrible thing? Isn't that anti-human? And I think that's complete nonsense. The thing is, if you had 10 or a billion or more, then we'd be quite lucky, I think, to get through the following 100 years in, um, in a tolerable state. In other words, if you had, just to do a bit of arithmetic, if you had 10 to the 10 billion, if you had 10 to the 10 people, in other words, 10 billion, and they lasted, let us say, 100 years, then the total number of pe pe people years is 10 to the 10 times 10 to the 2, which is 10 to the 12. You with me? You with me, ladies and gentlemen, as they say. But if you had only one billion, which is ten to the six, they could easily last. We should be thinking in terms of the next million years. In other words, ten to the six years. So, if you had ten to the nine um, people, in other words, one billion, and they lasted for a million years, you would have a total of ten to the fifteen. Um, person years before we really get into well, and then we can think again and carry on you see what i mean if you spread the human species out fewer at any one time they can go on for a million years easily and then think about the next million whereas if we go on as we are we're thinking in terms of decades or a few centuries before we're really in trouble you see my point so the point is the population is perfectly controllable and bring on, bring a, and it can be brought down to reasonable levels by benign means. But the snag is that nobody really is concertedly on the case. Mm. And when people do talk about population control, they talk about draconian measures. Quite wrong. And surely the problem isn't population itself. It's how the population is living. Oh, exactly so, yes. I mean, this is Paul Ehrlich in the 1970s made the point that you know, the, well, let's not drag, well, yes, the Americans get very self-righteous about it. And they say, you know, we only have two kids, you know, and, and these Bangladeshi people, they have seven or eight kids. And Paul Ehrlich, it was, who is himself a Californian, that, the, you know, the average Californian family with more and poor and two well-nourished children consume far more than an entire Bangladeshi village. So, you know, it is cons consumption and aspiration, material aspiration, times, total numbers, which really cause the trouble. Mm. Now, just briefly address the second thing, which is food. Again, people seem to think, well, the, pe the powers that be are designing agriculture for production, production, production. Now, that, as we can discuss later, is mainly for reasons of finance, mainly reason for profit. The more you produce, the more you have to sell, and the more money you can make. But they try to justify this by saying, well, since the population is going up, and since so many people in the world are already undernourished, I mean, according to the United Nations, a billion people are already undernourished, it's pretty obvious that we need a lot more food. So there was an official report from FAO about 2006, which says we need to um, increase world food output, by, I think, by 50% by 2050. Well, not, not at all. We already, as Hans Herren has said, he didn't say it yesterday, but he's often said it, um, we already produce enough easily to support 2,000 to try twice the present world population. We already produce enough for about 14 or 15 billion people. So we just don't need production, production, production. The moral of that is that we could easily provide ourselves with enough food, good food, provided, but sorry, but not if we stick with the present policy of production, 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 which is not driven by the desire to provide everybody with good food, which is driven by the desire to maximise wealth, because that's considered the thing that you have to do. Just very briefly, the third thing, climate change. Can we control this? Well, we can get it down to within tolerable level, limit, li limits, as we were talking yesterday, but only by radical changes. And the radical changes not only involve, well, basically cutting out fossil fuels as far as we can, well, uh, cutting them out, replacing them, but also lowering material aspirations. And again, at the core of this, always at the core of this, is agriculture. We have to farm in ways that are not consuming more and more and more fossil fuels and of course present day 
industrial agriculture designed to produce more and more food, designed to be more and more high tech, gobbles up the agriculture, uh, gobbles up the fossil fuel. And unless we radically change agriculture, we've got very little chance of, of c controlling climate. But again, one doesn't see people on this case concertedly enough. And the last thing, of course, is mass extinction. Now, to prevent or stop mass extinction and to allow the populations of creatures to build up again, certainly, as many people have pointed out, we need as much wilderness as possible, bearing in mind that real wilderness of a sort of pristine kind is now off the agenda because human beings have already had a tremendous impact on all of the world. But broadly speaking, we need some areas where human beings, as far as possible, just don't go. That would be the nearest we can get to the wilderness. We possibly need, possibly only, no, and if you, if you take a broad view of life, we undoubtedly need places too where only human beings go, where we're not welcoming other species at all. And I, to me, the sort of the, the most extreme example of that, but it makes the point, is the intensive care unit, where you only want, frankly, the patient who is being keep, uh, looked after. You don't want mice, you don't want starlings, you don't want extraneous bacteria more than you can help, and so on. So there's that extreme at the other end. But in between, which is most of the world, we want to create systems which accommodate both human beings and wild creatures, wild and inverted commas, living in harmony. And the rest of the world includes cities. We should have wildlife friendly cities, which they can be. And we should have wildlife friendly power stations, which they can be. And of course, we should have wildlife friendly farms. Mm. And it seems to me that unless farms in particular are much, much friendlier towards wildlife than they are at the moment, in fact, they're deliberately set out to be wildlife friendly, then the cause of wildlife conservation, the whole of the cause, is seriously compromised to the point where you might almost say it's dead in the water. Mm. I mean, wildlife friendly agriculture becomes a sine qua non, as the lawyers say. Mm. So this is my take on all the problems. They're huge, and there's other problems as well, poverty and so on, obviously. They're all huge, but they're all soluble. But in general, the world is moving in the wrong directions. Yeah, I um, you mentioned earlier about the economies still being geared towards maximizing consumption and economic growth rather than well-being, and something that I am, um, and also just now about farms being conceived as ecosystems, mm. um, and this is some a key theme of the book that I particularly love, um, and which is this holistic approach and a kind of holistic, coherent worldview that applies kind of key perennial principles to everyday life. And you talk mm. about how everything must be rethought in the light of everything else in order to get there. Um, and you you give us a very clear roadmap, um, which um, I believe starts with mindset and then leads towards infrastructure action, and then we get to the goal. Um, mm. And I'd love, I'd love you just to explain a little bit about this holistic overview and, and to talk about this roadmap um, yeah. I, might, I might bring it up actually. I've got um, I've got the screen. Um, I've got the slide. Hooray! So I'll bring it up. Yes, it's easier to talk about with the slide if it's there. Uh, there we go. It's probably a bit small, but never mind. I shall do my best. And this might take a few minutes, but there we are. Okay. <laughs> now the point is, I've tried to divide. The problems of the world and is it possible to get yeah i think um into 12 balloons 12 areas that we really need to think about and the balloons the things we really need to think about are arranged in four tiers let me just look at the tiers the top one is called the goal in other words what are we as a species humanity trying to achieve and i'm suggesting that what we should be trying to achieve is to create convivial societies, harmonious societies, in which everybody has a fair crack of the whip. In other words, convivial societies with personal fulfillment, everybody you know, doing what they feel good about, within a flourishing biosphere. And that little balloon there actually is the one at the top. You can't see me poking at it. No. But the one at the top, 
that's marked in white there is called convivial society and the big black bit around it is called um the flourishing biosphere a few little points here one is that it seems to me that most of the world's leaders big governments don't actually define clearly what it is they're trying to achieve i mean we find ridiculous slogans in britain like i don't know take back control i think was one was the was the brexit one and make make america great again god knows what that means but it doesn't mean anything good it's it's just it's you know it's it's crass it's just a slogan and that's what a whole country is supposed to, to, to rule itself by. And I'm suggesting that to, to say we need convivial society in a flourishing, in a flourishing biosphere is, is a worthy goal. It's what we should all be trying to do. And everything else that we need to do should be moving us towards that goal. And insofar as it moves us towards that goal, conviviality, flourishing biosphere, it can be considered, considered to be good. And insofar as it doesn't contribute, it's at best neutral and at worst bad. Very simple way of thinking, but I think we need a bit of simplicity along the way. Let me just expand on the idea of a flourishing biosphere. Biosphere means living world. And it's a, to me, it's a very good term. It's, it's what, you know, it, it's, it means... Well, you know what it means. It means the living world, the natural world. Whereas the word, the word that is now used, you know, the, the jargon in politics and economics and so on, is the environment. And politicians feel very proud when they use the word environment. But it's not the right concept. The word environment is very anthropocentric. And what the word environment literally means is surroundings. And surroundings in the present world means real estate basically it means nice scenery and it needs stuff that you own so you know estate agents sell things on the basis of a nice environment now again you see the word environment is as i say anthropocentric the idea the underlying idea is that we are the only important creatures and that the rest of it is stage scenery for our benefit the word biosphere the living world implies or if it doesn't imply it when it spells it out that we human beings are part of this. We are part of this ecosystem. And even if you look at, for example, Christianity, it's it's been horribly, I think, sent off course by this line in, Gen in Genesis about human beings having domin dominion over other creatures. Now, some people, a lot of people have interpreted dominion to mean that you know that it's all there for our benefit, and, and we can, can we, we, it's our right and our duty, indeed, to sort of biff the rest of nature into shape for our benefit. Some people say, no, that's a wrong interpretation. We should be talking about stewardship, which of course is a great improvement. But even stewardship is an anthropomorphic concept. It implies that we are and should be and can be in charge of the whole lot, whereas the word biosphere includes the idea i'll come to it later the idea of oneness that we are actually part of it and our job is not in a sense well our job is to do our best to, to keep it in good heart but we're not stewards of it we're we're, we're, we're we're integral parts and we make it work in the same way that we try to make a family work because you know it is it is what we do didn't express that very well but that is the point the goal flourishing uh enlightened uh, convivial society in a flourishing biosphere the next tier down asks the question what do we actually need to do in order to create uh convivial societies in a flourishing biosphere <clears throat> well the answer is all technology one one answer is the main answer is all technologies are relevant everything we actually do to manipulate the physical world is relevant and that includes all the crafts and also all the high tech and so on and so on but I think of all the technologies that we, we should deal with, the two that absolutely stand out are those of agriculture and food culture. Word about technology itself, the, the concept which um, matters is, is that of appropriate technology. And appropriate technology is technology that does what you actually want it to do. 
And what we need, I'm suggesting, is technologies that enable us to create convivial societies, make societies more convivial, and which look after the biosphere. Now, most uh, of our present day technologies don't really do that, and they're not intended to do that. One of the things is that our technologies so at the moment are, are getting to be so smart and so powerful that they make human beings themselves obsolete, redundant. Now, that's absurd. I mean, if, if the purpose of agriculture is to, sorry, of technology is to make ourselves obsolete, that, that, well, one can see the absurdity of that. Whereas what we actually need are technologies that enhance our lives and which, and the people who addressed this wonderfully, I think, in the 19th century were people like John Ruskin, who talked about the aesthetic necess the aesthetics of um, technologies, and William Morris, who picked up on this, and then in the 20th century, oh, anyway, that's the point. We need a new mindset applied, applied to technology as a whole and to rethink what we're really using it for. But of the two technologies that really matter, ones you absolutely have to get right, agriculture, and food culture. Let me just say a brief word about each. The, each. the, the fundamental the term I'm using is enlightened agriculture, and the shorthand version of enlightened agriculture is real farming, hence the Oxford Real Farming Conference, etc. And the point there is that um, enlightened agriculture is compounded of two very big ideas. One, of course, is agroecology, which occupies much of this meeting, and the other is food sovereignty, which also occupies much of this meeting. Now, agroecology basically says that you treat all farms as ecosystems. And, uh, yeah, basically it. And if you follow the sort of ecological rules of an ecosystem, design your farm accordingly, then everything's okay. Now, food culture, this is a wonderful thing. People seem to have got it into their heads, and governments sort of say this, and TV cooks say it to their shame so often, that if you want to sort of farm, that there's an incompatibility between proper farming and the desire to eat well. And this is complete and utter nonsense. If, and you can summarize the whole thesis in nine little words, the thing is, if you farm according to ecological principles, then you will focus on plant-based agriculture. That means arable and horticulture. That will be your prime purpose. That's where you get the majority of your calories and the majority of your protein. And, of course, most of the vitamins and minerals and all the other micro things that you need. But in a well-tempered agriculture, it's not entirely plants and it's not entirely arable, not entirely horticulture. There is no system of agriculture, I suggest, or of horticulture that does not benefit and it become more efficient and more stable if you introduce some animals. So actually, there should always be room for some animals in properly agroecological farming. And basically, we divide it into two, that you raise the ruminants in places and on fodder, which human beings don't like to eat and can't really make much use of, notably grass. So you raise livestock on, on hills and where it's wet and when it's too dry and all that kind of thing. And then you use the omnivores, the pigs and the poultry, to eat the leftovers and the surpluses and all the rest. That's the basic thing. Now, if you go down that route, you will indeed produce plenty of plants, but you will also produce some meat. And the second great principle, or um, however many I'm up to now, you get a maximum use of what grows locally. And if you do that, you will get a very, very varied, maximally diverse diet. Now, if you look at nutritional theory, the nutritional theory, so, so what you get, sorry, from in, enlightened agriculture, agroecology, is plenty of plants, not much meat, and maximum variety. Those are nine words. Now, if you look at nutritional theory for the last 60, 70 years, and I've been looking at it for the last 60 years because I started taking it seriously when I was at school, um, you find that that's what the recommendation is. Plenty of plants, not much meat, and maximum variety. 
because nowadays people emphasize, they say you don't need a fantastic amount of protein. You're better off if the diet isn't too high, high in fat, and what fat you do have should be pretty unsaturated on the whole. And people nowadays emphasize more than ever before the need for a huge variety of micronutrients, not only the well-known vitamins and the minerals, but also a range of things that some people, including me, call cryptonutrients, which are sort of too multifarious and small scale to analyze, really. Mm -hmm. So you get this, you need this variety to get that. So all the best nutritional theory says you need plenty of plants, not much meat, and maximum variety. And if you Let's just so, this room. <laughs> if you then ask what is the world's greatest cooking, world's greatest cuisines, and I suggest they are on an axis that runs from Italy in the west to China in the east, via Persia and a bit of France, I suppose, but via Persia and uh, Turkey and uh, India and via them into China. All of them have the same basic structure. All of them use plenty of plants with a huge emphasis on what grows locally. All of them are maximally varied, huge range of fruit and vegetables and whatever animal happens to die. All are low in meat. In Turkish, for example, Turkey's village, you have goat if a goat happens to die and you catch a few fish. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but, you know, that meat is there filling in. So they're all high in, and, and, and the function of meat in these great traditional cuisines, it's firstly as a garnish for flavor, secondly for stock, because if you have a good stock, you can do anything, and thirdly for the occasional feast. So the, that, the basic structure is plenty of plants, not much meat, and maximum variety. Three things, agroecological farming, sound nutrition, and the best possible cooking in the world are all based on this very, very simple nine-word slogan. That's all you need to know. But the other thing you need to know is if you really want to solve the world's food problems and you haven't got access to, a, you're not farming yourself, not everybody's going to farm, you can at least cook. And the thing is to cook well. And the cooking well actually means following the great traditions, particularly on, on that axis. But yesterday, for example, Jim Davidson was talking about whales. Well, if you look at traditional Welsh cuisine, even though they're very heavily orientated towards sheep and cattle, it basically, again, it's uh, it's the same basic structure. Plenty of plants, not much maximum variety. That's mm. it. Yeah. Nothing more so, so if our goal is this flourishing biosphere and a convivial society, and our action is appropriate technology, enlightened agriculture and food culture based on these princ ecological principles and moral and morality principles of morality. Then, mm -hmm. and in the diagram, we, ha we have infrastructure, which was democratic government, economic democracy and laws of the land. Um, if you were to expand a little bit on this concept of green economic democracy and yeah in relationship to a kind of democratic government, what would that look like? And do we not have a democracy now? Or how is our democracy not quite as it seems? Well, yes. Can we get the diagram up again or, or not? Yeah, I think it's up. Um, Sorry? I think it's up. I'll put it up again. Um, ah. There. It's up. Anyway, then, I'll, I'll pretend that it's up there. It is up. It is up, is it? Yeah. Because the thing is, if we're going to have a, a, a technology of the kind that really serves us well, including proper agriculture and good cooking, then you need a kind of, and you need a, a, an infrastructure that will encourage these things. And the infrastructure comes from the governance and it comes from uh, the economic structure and it comes from the laws of the land. Now, the governance, as I see it, should be fundamentally, it should be democratic. And there's lots of reasons for favoring democracy, one of which is that it seems to have something to do with justice. So we should all have a crack of the whip since we're all in the society. But also, and I think, it, it seems fairly clear to me that with democracy, you can make use of everybody's input, everybody's intelligence, everybody's experience. Uh, 
And then again, there's a good theme of this conference that actually you get much better agriculture when you take serious notice of indigenous forms of agriculture dreamed up by farmers in situ, peasant farmers, than you do if you try just to impose some sort of intellectual construct from above. And that actually is, is democracy in action. That's getting everybody to help to restructure the society. It's got to be democratic. When, and, uh, I'd like to go on about Trump and all that, and why, but I won't. Leaving that aside, so that's a fundamental thing. You want a government, you should ask a very first question you ask re with respect to government is, um, do we need the government at all? And there were people like Tolstoy at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, who said, actually, well, he was languishing under the czars, but he said, you know, actually, we could run the show much better if we didn't have government at all. Now, in that situation, he might have been correct. In most situations, you probably do need a government. And as Hans Heron said yesterday, you need bottom-up control, but you also need top-down control as well to sort of, as it were, make the big decisions and all that kind of stuff. Here we are. Here's the infrastructure down here. Uh, third tier down says infrastructure. So you do need government, but it's very, very important that the government should be on our side. This is the main thing. And if you look, say, at the British government at the moment, and, and most governments in the world, is the government really on the side of the people? And I think very often you find the answer is, well, not really. They're on the side of power groups. They're on the side of corporates, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we need a proper democratic government, which is achieved by all sorts of means. Haven't got time to go into it. But when it comes to the economy, you know, the thing to remember about the economy is that it is what Keynes said, John Maynard Keynes, is that it's a pragmatic device. It's not an ism in its own right. It's not an ideology in its own right. It's there to help us achieve our stated aims. And our stated aims, I'm suggesting, should be convivial society in a flourishing biosphere. Now, if you try to apply an, an, an economy that is purely kind of form, formulaic, that is in fact an ism, like communism, as, or Marxism would be a better way of putting it, or like neoliberalism, or indeed like Trumpism, which is now coming online, you mess it up. You, you're trying to turn something very complex, i.e. society, in, into a simple formula. And that really doesn't work. It never has worked. Or if it has worked, it's only occasionally and for a time it starts to collapse. And I'm suggesting, as a lot of other people have suggested, that the kind of demo uh, um, government we need, the kind of economy we need, is what a lot of people are calling green economic democracy. And the thing about green economic democracy, it, uh, to me, it's got sort of, well, it's got sort of several underlying principles, one of which is that nobody should be so rich that their richness gets in the way of other people, but nobody should be so poor that they can't live with dignity and they can't live um, with their, you know, with, with achieve fulfilment. And at the moment, in all countries in the world, you find that there are some people who are just, you might say, filthy rich, and there are some people who are too poor to live with dignity. And that is just intrinsically bad. So what we need is something green economic democracy, which looks after people and looks after the biosphere. And to me, um, there are six main components of green economic democracy. The first is that all should be conceived as every any kind of enterprise, whoever owns it, should be conceived as a social enterprise. In other words, the first question you should ask about any enterprise, whether it's a small farm or whether it's a corporate or whatever it is, does it actually contribute in net to the well-being of humanity? And does it actually help to maintain or improve the, the, the state of the biosphere? Is it? Wildlife friendly, basically, is the question. People don't ask that question anything like enough. And in fact, what they're really asking at the moment is, uh, is, is, is the enterprise um, profitable enough? Is it profitable enough to compete with everybody else's uh, efforts? And very often, of course, you find that the most profitable enterprises are also the least convivial and the least 
likely to contribute to the west to, to the well-being of the biosphere. An mm. example would be modern gold mining, which can be incredibly lucrative and which poisons everything in sight because you use mercury as a solvent to get the uh, gold out. So there's this absolute conflict between the what the economic model that's being applied and what we really need to do. So that's the first thing, conceive as a social enterprise. The second thing, I like the idea of what I and other people are calling the tripartite mixed economy. Now, the idea of the traditional mixed economy is that you divide ownership and you divide control between government on the one hand, so-called public ownership, and private ownership on the other. That's kind of okay as far as it goes, but they, we all need it needs tremendous caveats and conditional clauses in both cases. But an idea which I think is well worth developing is that one needs to introduce a third component, which is that of community ownership, which uh, the community is big enough to have clout, or it can be, but it's small enough in theory to be democratic. And for example, CSAs, I think, are a very good example of um, community enterprise, not necessarily ownership, but community enterprise, community taking control of what of what is done. And so that's the second thing is the tripartite mixed economy. The third component, or the fourth even, I can't remember, losing count, is the idea of positive investment. In other words, we could have the sort of capitalist idea that you invest your money in things and hope possibly hope to get some kind of profit, but you should only invest in things that are genuinely good, in other words, social enterprises, and or are genuinely trying to contribute to the well-being of, of, the, of the society, you sh of, the infra of the biosphere. You should not be uh, investing your money just because it gives you 6% rather than the usual 1%. So that's important positive investment. The fourth component, which I think is huge important actually, is the idea of universal basic income. Lots of people have looked at this. You know, everybody who is a citizen of a given country should receive some kind of payment just, just to keep them alive. It's got tremendous advantages and where it's been tried, it seems to work. And it helps to solve the part of the overall problem, which is how you ensure that everybody is rich enough to live with something resembling dignity and to achieve something like self-fulfillment. But it's not being taken seriously enough because people don't trust other people to, to to do anything at all if they're actually paid, in effect, for doing nothing. You see what I mean? Mm. We're going to have a lot of trust in human beings. And then in order to achieve greenness, we should move away from the idea that we should all be trying to produce as much as possible, be as rich as possible, have as many material possessions as possible, move away from that idea to the opposite idea, which is how little do we really need in order to live a good life? And the answer is, and certainly in the Western world, probably in third of what we now consume, we could live perfectly well with if, if we... If we well, if our mindset was, if we set our minds that way. And the last thing, of course, is the idea of the circular economy, where you don't actually um, create things with um, built in obsolescence. You don't create things to have a short life. You create things in order to have the longest possible life. And you build things in a way that enables you to dismantle them when their sort of first life is done and reassemble them in other forms and so on and so on. It is more than recycling. This is going beyond recycling. But the yeah. circular economy needs to be really worked on. Thank you, Colin. Before we move on to um, audience questions, um, I'd love just to expand a little bit more on the concept of community that you've just been talking about um, and localization and the role that community will have in um, in bringing about the renaissance that your book addresses mm -hmm. and why it has to be a grassroots initiative rather than coming from the ground up rather than from the top down. Mm -hmm. and, and also about the role of conviviality, compassion, collaboration um, within that concept of community. And you talk about that a fair amount in the book as well in yeah. the, the idea of competition. Yep, yep, yep. I'll focus on the second one first, if I may, the whole idea of conviviality and competition. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of my time, because basically I'm a biologist, I like to think, 
Um, I spent a lot of my time talking about Darwin, thinking about Darwin. Now, the whole, what people call Darwinism, is traditionally taught, not as what Darwin taught, not as Darwin said, but actually as Tennyson said. Tennyson, 20 years before Darwin, talked about nature red in tooth and claw. And I think a lot of people have the idea that that is what Darwinism is about. Darwin did stress competition. He did stress the fact that... Um, you know, animals and plants have a tendency to outbreed their resources and therefore they must, in the end, fight for resources, struggle for life, as he said, which was the idea that came from the economist Malthus at the beginning of the 19th century. So he did focus on the idea that in order to survive, we all have to compete. But he also stressed that what we're really, that we also, animals also cooperate and I think one of the great developments since Darwin has been the realization that life as a whole and the universe as a whole are not fundamentally competitive. At least that's not quite true. If you look at the universe or life as a whole, there is a huge element of competition in there, of course. But actually, natural selection is about survival. And the best survival tactic, beyond any doubt, is to cooperate with with other creatures to, to for a common end and if you look at life as a whole ecosystems etc you find that it's a balance between cooperation and competition if you look at the human body which is a, a huge collection of cells it's a master class of collaboration all the cells actually have a, the possibility of living independent lives but as it were they choose to live collaboratively and they all do well out of it by creating a whole organism and if you look at the individual cell the so-called euro 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 what's it called eukaryotic cell it is a masterclass again in cooperation incorporating elements from many different organisms so actually, if you look at the universe as a whole, including the physical universe, including the, you find, yes, there's an element of competition, but cooperation is, if anything, greater. Now, the idea, if it wasn't, if the universe weren't, wasn't more cooperative, it would actually fall apart and life wouldn't work unless it was fundamentally cooperative. Ecosystems wouldn't work, eco, e organisms wouldn't hold together, etc., etc. Now, I was also been involved in my time in discussing neoliberal economics, which of course is rooted in the idea that you must be maximally competitive, compete in the marketplace and all that stuff. And competition is now seen widely, certainly among economists, <laughs> as the, the, the greatest human virtue. You know, we must compete, compete. It's complete rubbish. And that is said to be Darwinian. Because, you know, didn't Darwin say we must compete, compete, compete? And because it seemed to be Darwinian, it seemed to be natural, uh, biological, and natural is seen to be good. Now, that's very, very bad biology. And it's also very, very bad moral philosophy. Because, again, the real problem is that life is more cooperative than it is competitive. And, of course, it's also true that one can't say that what is natural is necessarily good, although it's a good idea as far as possible, to base morality in what can be seen to be natural, the whole idea of natural law. Anyway, my point is that a lot of people think that human beings, and have been brought up to think, that human beings can't live convivially because we are fundamentally competitive creatures and we are bound to compete and we will betray each other and all those things. That's the sort of underlying mindset behind the, 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 the urge to compete but actually if you start with the opposite view which is which is more true which is that it, it's fundamental to us to cooperate and then say well, that it would be more natural to have an economy that was cooperative then it, the, all, all the other problems start to solve themselves because once we cooperate cooperate then you know we can achieve wonders which is what this conference is largely about and so many farmers and so on are demonstrating mm. Thank you, Colin. Um, I'm keen to move on to some of the audience questions. Um, the main key theme that was arising is with regard to the opening conversation, which was about population and the relationship between population and um, a very colonial mindset. 
Um, mm. And you spoke about regulation, um, I mean, you spoke about benign population reduction measures in kind of geological timescales. Um, mm. But how would the world regulate these measures to ensure that the burden isn't placed on women um, and that these geologic timescales are preferable, but very different to um, the timescales on which governmental systems currently act? Yeah. Well, the thing is, if, if you went down the benign route and, and just enabled people to have fewer children because that's what they want to do, always do what people want to do, the, 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 the job for government, I would say, in general, is to create conditions in which good things can happen. If we say a smaller population, smaller family size would be good, then you need to create conditions in which that becomes a good thing to do. Now, you talk about the burden falling on women. In a sense, the burden of childbirth does fall on women because you're the only people that can give birth. It's uh, unjust, possibly, but that's that's the way it is. But the thing is, the, at the moment, the burden falls very, very heavily on women because in many societies, what, what, in what one might call primitive societies, the only way a woman can get any real status in the society, achieve any real kudos, <clears throat> is by being a homemaker. And in many societies, you, you get more kudos, kudos by having lots of children and being head of a very big household than you do by just having one or no children and being head of, in effect, of very little. So it's the it's the present societies which 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 are placing the burden on women. What I'm suggesting is that if you do the things that most people would like to see happen anyway, I mean most enlightened people, um, and now enable women to achieve far more in fields other than motherhood, so that they can free to be properly educated and take up other professions and so on and so on. It is simply the case, and empirical, empirically the case, that the more opportunities women have outside the homemaking motherhood role, the more, the fewer children they feel impelled to bring into the world. Now, some people might always want to have eight or nine children, but there'll only be a few. And most women, it turns out, in, a, in, a, in reasonably affluent societies, like Italy, like Germany, like Britain of recent years, choose of their own volition to have two, two children or even fewer. And if you create the conditions in which that's what women prefer to do, A, I don't see that that's imposing a burden. I think that's the, the complete opposite. It's, it's providing women with many more options and actually a much easier life if they choose it. Uh, and it would it is benign and it would bring the population down quite rapidly in decades rather than in thousands of years. The real problem, actually, which governments have always found hard to solve, is <coughs> sorry, when the when the birth rate starts to go down, uh, and what happens is that the the, the average age of the population inevitably goes up because you've got fewer babies. And if you combine that with ad longer life, you find that people are living for 20 or 30 years after they retire, whereas traditionally people retired from work and then they died a few years later. But what that means in a modern society, you've got an aging population with a smaller and smaller workforce. So governments have a tendency to encourage women to have more children, which I would have thought was quite burdensome, in order to provide the next generation with a workforce. This is what Putin is doing now, actually. He's encouraging Russian women really to have as many children as they can, which is a very anachronistic thing to do, but that's what he's doing. And as Fred Pierce pointed out in a very, very good book, I think, called People Quake a few years ago, um, the best solution, short-term solution for a country whose populations are going down and whose age, therefore, is average age is going up, is immigration. We should, in Britain, we should be welcoming Poles and Pakistanis and other people who, who can't make a living in their own house. Well, they can now in Poland, but 
Eastern Europe and find it difficult to make a living there and come and live in. It's very convenient. It's not a long term solution, but it's not a bad short term solution. And it helps other people as well. In the longer term, though, I think what we need is technologies. I, I hate to go for a techno fix, but we need, well, we need a different attitude to work so that you don't have to work frantically hard all your life to make a living. And if people didn't have to work quite so hard, they could work longer. And you need technologies that make it easier for older people to carry on doing whatever it was they did before, which again, be not being aimed at, not being tried. So, you know, the kind of solutions that will bring the population down, it could work within decades. Um, they could certainly work in a few centuries. And I don't see anything objectionable about any of them. Mm. And if you do object, it's a democracy. You don't have to go along with it. Mm. I'd really like us to emphasise though, that it's not about population, but it's about how we're living, and it's and it's about the system, um, and yeah. and distribution, and, and and also the fact that we know that there's enough food produced to support a vast population, much bigger than we've already got. Mm. Um, and one of the questions in the chat that arose was what about the supply of materials if we move away from fossil fuel and extractive models um well if if one thing is i think we, ha we do have to lower our material expectations we don't have to live as affluently as even britain does and we certainly don't have to aspire to live like the californians do it's just nonsense so when we all know that cliche statistics that it would take five planets Earth to keep everybody in the style of the average American, and probably about 10 to live in the style of a middle class um, Californian. So it's just not on. But you can live very comfortably with much less material stuff than we have, much less, half, third. And if you focus your whole economic effort, build your whole society, around food and agriculture. Food is the greatest source of conviviality. And if we, all, if we focused properly on creating enlightened agriculture based on agroecology, we could have a very, very agreeable life without using, well, using methods that simply don't um, extract from the world and any, more than, than can be sustained. I mean, it's, Sustainable long-term life is perfectly possible, is, is the answer to that, really. Thank you. So in the last few minutes, um, I'd love you just to address how we can go about changing mindset and reaching the um, renaissance that your book talks about. Well, I think there's two, two approaches, really. Uh, the whole idea of renaissance is that it's not revolution. I mean, it is revolutionary in its effect because it does, in fact, turn everything around, which is what revolution means. But, but revolution traditionally implies that you have a confrontation. You sort out the people you don't like and you, 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 you try and get rid of them. That was basically what Trump was trying to do in the last couple of days with his invasion of the capital, you know, a direct attack on the people in charge. I think that's... Well, sometimes that's necessary. It wasn't necessary yesterday or the day before, but it's sometimes necessary, but it isn't the ideal. Revolutions rarely achieve the kind of end that you really want to achieve, and there's always huge collateral damage. The whole idea of renaissance, first point one, is that you just start doing things. Jane Davidson said it yesterday. If you want to do something different, just do it. And there are, well, as represented at this conference, there are, there are around the world literally millions of small enterprises of one kind or another that are already creating the kinds of, and already the kinds of things that the world needs in order to put itself back on its feet, conviviality, flourishing biosphere. It's really happening. The more small things that happen with people behind them that really want them to happen, at the moment, you've got little islands of sanity where these enterprises are, 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 are functioning, CSAs and so on. The idea of Renaissance is that you get more and more of them until eventually there's so many that they coalesce and the coalescence is already happening. And then you get a genuine alternative structure 
that, that, that people in the, who are bound up with the status quo can leave the status quo and have somewhere else to go. But it's a question of building the world that you want to see in situ, having as few fights as possible with, as it were, the, the powers that be. Now, so Renaissance is very different from uh, revolution. It's also very different from uh, mere reform. I mean, reforms can achieve a certain amount and achieve, often achieve quite a lot. I mean, I think slavery was officially ended by a series of reforms. But in the end, uh, reform is not enough because in the end, reform tends to leave the basic structure intact and just tweak. And that's not enough. We've got to rethink the whole structure, including the economy and so on and so on. As for the last bit, that is absolutely important, the idea of mindset, got to change the mindset. And one of the things, the components of that, as I mentioned at the beginning, that our attitude to the natural world at the moment is fundamentally exploitative. And even when you talk about our, our, our role as stewards, you're still being anthropocentric. Whereas the real mindset is to consider the... the the, 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 us as part of nature, but also to think of the late, reinstate the concept of the sacred, which has gone missing completely. What I'm suggesting is, we can't want to put the diagram up at this point, but what I'm trying to devise with our College for Real Farming and Food Culture is a system of education that takes all these things into account from the very beginning, what, what, as you use the word holistic, and that's right, everything part of everything else, everything related to everything else. So it's a new education that we need. And we're starting by running courses and by collaborating with a, a, a new university in Wales called the Black Mountain College uh, to, 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 to introduce this kind of education as, as a, and I would like it to become the norm over time that's that's a that, so it's the, these two approaches on the one hand encouraging the grassroots initiatives and on the other getting to the ideas by this new education this new kind of holistic attitude holistic teaching and i've summarized all the ideas just to remind you <laughs> and uh, let me just say that um blackwells who are selling it online are apparently out of stock. Isn't that terrible? It hasn't come out yet, really. But Waterstones online do have them in stock. So it's very, very obtainable, should you wish to attain one, which I think is the only sensible thing to do. <laughs> Thank you so much, Colin. And I highly recommend reading the book. Um, it's an amazing book and so clearly outlines so many of the problems and clear ways to, um, to create the future that we all hope for. Um, so we, we've got a Zoom link um, to continue asking some of the questions that we didn't get time to talk about. Um, Colin, have you got the link there? Uh, I think I will have with any luck. Great, um, because then we'll switch over to Zoom and we can continue with the questions. Um, but thank you so much for everyone who's joined for this part of, um, of the launch. And yep. I'll see you on Zoom.